The Field Museum's Pacific Collection is enormous. It's truly one of the world's great collections of anthropological artifacts from the Pacific Islands. Parts of this collection come from excursions to the Pacific, anthropologists going to the source to try to understand the people and the material in that part of the world. In the winter of 1958, the curator of the Pacific Collection, Roland Force, he took a different kind of collecting excursion. He packed up with his wife, Mary Ann, and moved to London for six months. They went there in order to finalize the sale of one of the greatest private collections of Pacific artifacts ever known. I'm, I'm Mary Ann Force. To us, it just seemed cold and dreary. <laughs> the sun never came out, I think. This collection was not the product of a long-term visit to the Pacific. In fact, the man who owned it had never even seen the Pacific Ocean. Instead, this collection was the life's work of Captain Alfred Walter Francis Fuller, a private collector who got his things from auctions and antique stores. By the time of the sale, this eccentric man had amassed over 6,500 objects. And the artifacts, they came from across the Pacific Islands. The breadth of the collection was truly remarkable. As a condition of the sale, Dr. Force and Captain Fuller sat down and recorded for over 180 hours, six months, and they talked about each object in the collection. It's the New Zealand bamboo flute, etched all over. Nice old specimen, huh? perfect, not cracked. The it's specifics of what the men talked about are undoubtedly helpful to the researchers and anthropologists here at the Field Museum. But the tapes are dry and dull, and it's hard not to wonder about all kinds of things that weren't covered in the interviews. Who was Captain Fuller? What was he like? How could he afford the collection? And most of all, what drove this man to collect? Well, the tantalizing thing is that you, you have the transcripts, which are the base for all Fuller information. That is Hermione Waterfield. She used the tapes and transcripts to help her write her book called Provenance. She was only partially right about the tapes being the only source of information about Fuller. Hermione herself is a great resource for understanding him. Between her knowledge and the insights of Marianne Force, you can really start to piece together who this man might have been. Figure out the parts of his life that aren't in the tapes. You know all those wonderful programs on Masterpiece Theater? Usually the characters who are the good guys, the bright guys, are called gentry. Fuller was... Absolute gentry. He, you know, was generous and welcoming, but also very dictatorial and not exactly cantankerous, but he always knew what was what and what was best. He was a terribly honorable man. He had a great deal of integrity. He was born in 1882, and the time he was a, like a nine-year-old child, he had collected and kept collecting. It started even before that. In the biography he typed up for the museum, he says, I began collecting at the age of four, my favorite item being a wingless deadhead moth body, which I insisted on taking to bed with me every night. I date my partiality for skulls from that time. Fuller came from a middle-income family, a family with a good name, but not a ton of money. His father was a minister, though, and they did have some property. His father was a collector already. His grandfather helped found the museum um, in Winchester. Um, and, you know, it was very much um, in their blood. Although Fuller knew his first love was for collecting, he must have had some sort of practical side because he trained to be a lawyer. And then he joined the army. <laughs> World War I came, of course, much earlier for the British than it did for us. And typical of Fuller, he joined as a private and worked his way up to captain. But World War I was not an easy place to be. His health suffered, and he started to go deaf. And when he returned, he knew he didn't want to be a lawyer. He didn't like it. Fuller's health continued to be poor, and he also was bored to death being a solicitor. And so he quit. It was a pretty bold move. He had very little money coming in, just a small army pension. The money that the Fuller family had went to Captain Fuller's older brother after their dad died. Those were the rules of inheritance. And the brothers, they didn't get along too well. You see, Captain Fuller's older brother, 
was a brilliant war strategist for Hitler. Uh, he was embarrassed by his brother because he was so well thought of in Germany. That's putting it mildly. Fuller's brother was an honored guest at Hitler's 50th birthday party, and he invented one of the major war strategies used by Germans during World War II. Because the two Fuller brothers didn't see eye to eye on political matters, his brother didn't share the family wealth, and they grew estranged. Well, he resented him, I would, because he got the small Irish castle and all the money. Despite his lack of funds and lack of a castle, Fuller was relentlessly committed to his collection. He spent his days going to sales, combing over his things, meticulously writing and cataloging everything he had. His day started at noon, and he worked until the early hours of the morning. Slowly, his house filled with items, and piece by piece, the collection was built. And he never sold anything. Well, you know, he kept on stressing this thing that he was a gentleman and not a dealer, and that he would, you know, was a hate to be taken as a commercial venture. Fuller had very little income coming in. He didn't want a job, and he refused to sell any part of his collection. You can imagine the state of the Fuller finances. He himself had very little money. Fuller was proud of what a collection he had, despite his financial situation. He loved a deal, and he would make great sacrifices to get an object. He had a gold watch chain that was very high value gold, and whenever he needed some money, he would pawn his chain <laughs> so he could afford the specimen, and then he'd buy it back from the man. And it was not a joke. I mean, it was just the way he did it. He had his personal lender, and by his side the whole time was his adoring wife Estelle. Well, she was a very supportive wife, you know, to, to to sort of starve yourself, as it were, at least no, to live very, very simply and let your husband have his, you know, leash on spending all your money. He had the most wonderful, lovely, gracious wife.、Um, you know, they, they, I'm sure they ate very frugally. It was, I mean, it's amazing in those days, the amount of bread and margarine with a scraping of jam, and they'd live off this for days. You know. Which would send us in with horror, you know. Estelle and Fuller were childhood sweethearts, and by every indication, she was madly in love with him because she put up with a lot. He proposed to her next to his favorite artifact in the British Museum. He cut short the honeymoon to go to a sale, and you know that habit he had as a kid of taking pieces of his collection to bed with him at night. And from the time he was a child, he would put it under his pillow, or somehow on the bed if it were too big for her, under the pillow, and he would sleep with it. But she took it all in stride. In fact, by all accounts, she was a wonderful, thoughtful woman. For more than forty years, Fuller collected but never sold, all so that he might be called a gentleman and not a merchant. In the end, though, he sold everything. He had a terrible situation in that he had an invalid daughter, and I do mean quite invalid daughter. Also, his wife was aging, so he had a desperate financial need. Fuller knew that he had to provide for his wife and child after his death. There was so little money left, and he didn't want to leave his family with nothing. He knew they would be forced to sell off his artifacts piecemeal so they could survive, and this was out of the question. And that brings us back to the rainy London winter of 1958. Fuller had struck a deal with the Field Museum after many offers and much debate. There were a lot of museums and collectors who wanted pieces of the collection, but only the Field would agree to all of his terms and do all of the work to get it, which included an ironclad contract and a commitment to never separate out the artifact. To take the Fuller collection, was you take one specimen, you take all 6,500 of them. And so the forces came over, and Roland sat with him, and Fuller and Force went through each object one at a time. The target task reads、uh, Southeast New Guinea, a lime mortar of boat-shaped type. Tonight, the first so many of the unfortunate. Fuller himself never got to see the collection here in Chicago. He died in December of 1961, just a few years after parting with his beloved artifacts. Even on his deathbed, he thought of the collection. He dictated a letter to his wife the night he died, asking the Field Museum to take care of his things. And now, fifty years later, the Field Museum houses this great collection, all six thousand five hundred objects.、Um, well, it is so comprehensive for the Pacific. You can just go to the field and, and really follow through on various aspects. Fuller's life and impulse to collect 
they seem to require an explanation. He lived out his days in a way that is all but impossible now. He went to auctions and lived off a great name and a meager pension with the support of an adoring, selfless wife. His life story answers a lot of questions, like how he could afford the collection or what he might have been like if you had met him at a party. But we still can't know why exactly Fuller lived such a strange life or what drove him to collect. Even if we could ask the man himself, it seems unlikely that he could explain what motivated him. And so we're left intrigued. And we're left with the knowledge that this man created a great collection that's helpful to understanding the people of the Pacific. It's really unparalleled. And only a man as eccentric as Fuller could have created it. <laughs>